This is Floss Weekly, episode 777, recorded Wednesday, April 3rd. Asterisk. Wait, faxes? This week we sit down with Joshua Culp, the Asterisk Project lead. We talk about the Asterisk Project, its new corporate home at Sangoma, and then fax machines and why we all still get spam calls. You don't want to miss it, so stay tuned. Hey, it is time for Floss Weekly. That's the show about free, libre, and open source software. I'm your host, Jonathan Bennett, and I've got David Ruggles with me today. Hey, David, how is it? Going good. It's it's good to have you. First time on Floss Weekly as a co-host. Not your first time to co-host with one of my shows. And uh, we, we brought you over for a very particular reason, and that is today's guest was your request. In fact, you've bugged me several times about this. Uh, get get this guy. This would be really fun. We need to ask about this one particular thing. And uh, I agreed. I thought it would be cool. So I reached out and we've got uh, we've got Joshua Culp from Asterisk as the guest. And uh, David, Asterisk is something that you're familiar with, isn't it? It is. Um, I've, I go way back with Asterisk into the early 2000s. Um, I happened to actually get to go to Digium down in Huntsville. Um, for those of you on the video, I am wearing the shirt. Uh, <laughs> so I, I went there, I got the shirt. Um, and uh, I've actually, I don't do as much with Asterix now as I did uh, probably five, five to seven years ago or so. It was the last mm-hmm. time I was really into Asterix. Now I'm into the other sides of the Sangoma company. Uh, I sell and support Switchfox and ah. stuff to some of my clients. Um, but uh Asterix is, I just, I love the project. Um, mm-hmm. I love the story behind it and I'm excited to talk about it. Uh, so yes, I'm a, I'm a bit of a fangirling today. <laughs> I understand. Oh, I, well, I've been, I've been around Asterix for a long time too, which might make this an interesting interview because we're, we're both, we're both kind of insiders on this. There might be a lot of inside baseball that happens. Um, I'm, I'm going to try to channel my inner noob so that we can get some of those basic questions out. Uh, but I know I've been doing Astros for a long time as well. And like you, not as much here recently. And part of that, I think, is because everybody uses cell phones these days. And some other things locally have changed. Maybe I'll get into the story of, of my attempts to get one of our local telecom companies to give me raw SIP. It did not, it did not end with a good end. They, they were not willing to do that. But we, we almost got there, and I would have rolled out so many asterisk boxes if we'd done that. But anyway, let's not, uh, let's not waste any more time. Let's go ahead and bring our guest on. Uh, Joshua, thank you, sir, for being here. Hi, it's nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Yes. So we're talking, we're talking asterisk, and I'm not sure which way I want to go first. Maybe you can answer both of these questions in one go. Um, the the big question I think some people are going to have is what what is Asterisk? I've never heard of this. And then the other side of that question is how are you involved with Asterisk? Yeah, so Asterisk is these days a communications toolkit. Um, we're about giving people the tools to build cool things in the communication space. Mm-hmm. Um, that might be a call center, that might be an omni-channel solution, that might just be a phone system for a business Mm -hmm. um, in the cloud or locally. Um, Previously in the beginning, Asterisk was really centered around being a phone system, but over time, we've really changed into that communications toolkit perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, And personally, um, I'm what I say is the project lead. Um, Basically means I make sure that the ship is pointed in generally the right direction. So that's taking feedback from the community, from internally at Sangoma, from other places, and just figuring out um, where we need to go next and what needs to be a focus, and also the normal day-to-day stuff like Mm -hmm. deciding policies and that kind of stuff. Now, how how long have you been with the Asterisk Project? Do you do you go all the way back to when it was the the pet project for a Linux support company? (laughs) Uh, almost. So I think I came in around 2001 or 2002. Okay. Um, Asterisk, uh, Asterisk itself, uh, as it's known today, actually came about in 1999. Mm-hmm. So a few years. Um, fun fact that not many people know, um, the version of Asterisk that exists now is actually the second iteration of it. 
Mm-hmm. Um, there was one previously um, that was completely scrapped where it had no configuration. Your configuration was C code. <laughs> and if you wanted to change your configuration, you would change the C code and recompile. It's it's, it's just like it's just like Unix. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, the current one was actually um, asterisk ng, Aha. Um, but then it just turned into asterisk. That's that's fun. Um, and so we, we kind of hinted at it, but when asterisk first started, before you got on board, it was it was a part of uh, Digium, I believe, and they wanted to do they wanted to do Linux support, and they needed a phone system. Isn't that the way that story goes? So it Digium didn't even exist yet. It was uh, Linux support services. Um, headed up by Mark Spencer, and he needed a phone system, like you said, Mm -hmm. um, but did not have much money. And Mark is the type of person that he will (laughs) code what he needs. And so he coded a phone system. There you go. Over time, it took over. Yeah, uh, we had, I think we had Mark on Floss Weekly years and years ago, one of the very early episodes. And I think he said something to the effect of, it turns out it's more fun to play with phone systems than it is to do Linux desktop support. <laughs> yep. Not not wrong at all there. Okay. So my experience with Asterisk was building building phone systems. And like I said during the top of the hour, when it was actually the local cable company started rolling out... Um, phone service through Doxis, they would they would give us an analog port on the uh, on the cable modem and i went because i i was i was fairly well tied into the company at the time and i went to him i'm like hey i know that's running sip on the back end and in fact Mm. it's probably talking to an asterisk server somewhere on the back end can you let me get to that sip directly they're like, oh, I don't know. We'll go and find out. And they, you know, they talked about it inside corporate or whatever. And they came up to me. They're like, no, we can't do that. And funny thing, it wasn't too long after that that they started selling actual business phone systems where they would do the thing essentially that I was asking them to do. Um, <laughs> which did, yeah. Struck, so struck a, me as funny. additional fun fact. I'm gonna I'm gonna have a lot of fun facts today. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cable systems. At least they didn't, and I don't know if they do these days or not. They didn't use SIP. They used a completely different protocol called um, MGCP, okay, um, which was much more um, – SIP places much more intelligence in the endpoint, so like a phone or a ATA to convert from SIP to analog. Mm-hmm. Um, MGCP was much more um, lower level, the remote side – controlling the endpoint being like go off hook and that kind of thing Mm -hmm. um why the whole cable world went that route i don't know (laughs) it's the cable world Um, yeah fiber on the other hand does generally use sip thankfully or not thankfully depending upon your opinion of sip (laughs) well sip tends to just work i i do remember another experiment where i tried to make iax the inter asterisk exchange format work between two different boxes found out the hard way that you have to have i think it was really really tight timing to make that happen and i didn't have the hardware to do that (laughs) that's is that one of those things that's kind of fallen by the wayside or is iax still around uh, so from a module perspective, IX does still exist. Some people swear by it, but most of our effort and time goes into SIP because SIP has taken over the world, essentially. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. People every day, whether they realize it or not, are probably using SIP. Probably using asterisk. People every day, I'm sure, are using asterisk and don't even realize it at some point along the call path. Do you have an idea of, of like how many asterisk installs there are out there and, and how many calls get handled on them? Uh, so the only so from a project perspective, we don't have we don't report metrics or anything back. Mm-hmm. Um, the most I have is download statistics of what's grabbing tarballs. And even then, if they grab it from Git, I don't have visibility into that. Um, so from a downloads perspective, it's about 1.5 million downloads a year. Um, from a calls perspective, uh, I should also add that's only downloads. That doesn't include products that use asterisk, such as Switchbox or Free PBX or mm-hmm. other stuff or custom solutions or any of that. Um, from a calls perspective, not really, but still a ton. <laughs> a ton. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I, I have. 
I can derive certain stuff internally because we do hosted phone systems, so mm -hmm. I can si kind of see trends and stuff that way. Um, but voice is still very much alive. This is the Floss Show, all about open source. And um, as we already said, I've used Asterix for a long time, but I've kind of fallen out of it. Um, back when I was active in Asterix, uh, I was using a lot of Sangoma hardware, their T1 interface cards and stuff. So I've always had a um, positive view and relationship with Sangoma from, uh, I guess, end user perspective. Um, and I think it's very interesting to, from a distance, follow the transition as they have become the open source phone system company. Um, and they're really expanding into a lot of different areas. Um, I guess Star to Star, they just purchased recently, which we're not even going there. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I think that was two have... acquisitions ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that would not surprise me. Um, and they're definitely an M and A company, mergers and acquisitions. Um, but one of the things that I've seen, some that I'd love to, for you to speak to, if it's uh, not unreasonable, is there's been some concern in the open source community that Sangoma may not be quite as open source friendly as Digium was. Um, I haven't seen anything personally, but again, I'm kind of looking at it from the thirty thousand foot view. So, would you be able, willing to speak to that? Uh, sure. Um, so from an open source perspective, from an asterisk perspective, I'll speak first. Um, absolutely nothing changed between Digium and Sangoma. Um, if anything, we were given more freedom at times um, to just kind of do our thing. Um, from a free PBX perspective, um, I've actually been helping to try to get them to be more standardized on open source and more friendly on open source, um, standardizing processes and stuff. Um, and then as a company, our latest acquisition, I think, um, was a company called, here, I'll ask questions. Do you know who Phonality is? That's a SIP provider, isn't yeah. it? Uh, probably. Everyone's <laughs> a SIP provider these days. If well, they the, the, deal name, with the, the, legal stuff. the name sounds familiar. I'll put it that way. Okay. We'll go from, uh, do you know who Net Fortress is? Not offhand, nope. no. Nope. Do you know who Trixbox is? Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's all the same company. Okay. Um, so our latest acquisition was actually, through a roundabout way, kind of the Trixbox company. Mm -hmm. um, and as part of that, they have their own asterisk that they forked and made changes to and such. And from an open source perspective, we took those generally applicable changes and just made them open source. Um, cool. We took their giant change set and picked out the parts that were generic and just made it out there so other people could use it, um, including competitors. I know there's some competitors that took some of the stuff and just used it for their thing. Mm -hmm. I'm fine with that. Um, so we're still, uh, the goal, my personal goal is I don't want to maintain multiple versions of Asterisk. So if I can open source uh -huh. everything I can, I will. Yes. <laughs> so I don't hold anything back if I can. Um, and I'm pushing that internally. Um, at Astrocon, I forgot what I called myself. I think the overlord of open source at Singoma. <laughs> um, just overseeing all that stuff and pushing it. Um, and the same goes, I'm really going off on a tangent now. Um, also getting teams and stuff to contribute patches upstream and stuff as well. Um, so trying to do open source as much as we can. That's very encouraging to hear. Um, and thank you for answering that because, again, it was kind of second party. Um, I hadn't seen any of the issues directly, but anytime there's a big change, especially with a company as large and as diversified as Sangoma, you get a little bit of panic. Yep. Um, I mean, IBM and Red Hat is a whole different uh, open source story that we are yes. not going on. Not today. <laughs> not yeah, I mean, to give a little bit more of a glimpse, I talk to the CTO weekly about open source stuff. We have an open source team where we all get together and talk about stuff. Um, so, That's awesome. Yep. So uh, now in to kind of circle back to the IAX conversation from a second ago, I actually have uh, infrastructure that I 
sort of tangentially support where we bring SIP into it and then we have a whole series of asterisk clusters behind it and we're using IAX between all the clusters. Oh. Um, so we, we bring SIP in from all our external connections but then everything in-house is IAX and it's because of that tight timing and stuff. So we might convert to SIP at some point. Um, we're also running older versions of Asterix behind it because it works and it's not exposed to the internet. So, <laughs> Yeah. Um, from a conversion perspective, going slightly technical here, um, at a larger scale, uh, e, uh, not e, uh, SIP should scale better with packets. Um, okay. Just because of the threading model of X2 where it has to... Um, Stuff you can't you can't distribute the load as much in X2, but in SIP um, it gets more distributed. So I am curious then about hardware support um, because D Digium used to make some hardware, and I believe Sengoma makes a lot of hardware too. And once upon a time, it used to be a massive pain to try to take one of these cards and uh, actually add them to an asterisk machine because so much of the hardware, the, d the driver support was out of tree. It was not actually in the upstream Linux kernel. And so there was, there was compiling. And if you updated your kernel, you had to go and compile again. And if you forgot, then you would get the 8 a.m. phone call after the thunderstorm because the, the server turned itself off and turned itself back on again and with a new kernel and nothing works anymore. Um, it, have, we gotten, have we gotten any better about this? Is Asterisk hardware actually upstreamed into the Linux kernel these days? No. <laughs> ah! No. Uh, hardware, is a dy hardware is a dying thing. <laughs> what, it's, what's... It's, what it's turned into is just using um, SIP gateways instead okay. appliances i suppose um, that's what that's what most people do these days they just set up a box and generally just forget about it unless something breaks which usually these days is upstream pri problems yeah that that sounds about right um it makes a plus lot it of means, sense plus it means also that you can send it up uh, the cloud i hate saying the cloud <laughs> into hosted instances elsewhere on someone else's computers <laughs> yes did, did the idea of running your own hardware die because the driver's problem was so bad? Is that what caused that? <laughs> uh, from a hardware perspective, you mean? Just from an end user perspective. Like if somebody wants to build an asterisk box, why why did people move away from you know buying a, a four-port FXO card and slapping it on a PCI bus? Uh, multiple reasons, I think. Um, one, it's becoming harder to actually get um, lines and stuff from upstream carriers. Yeah, okay. From a phone's perspective, the cost of SIP phones has gone down, and then the experience can generally be better than an analog phone, mm -hmm. um, which is why ATAs kind of also came down in price. So it's like, uh, deal with the kernel driver, <sighs> have it in there, or just buy a however many dollar ATA physical appliance and just go from there. Um, there's also cases in like um, hotel rooms and stuff where you need a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And so it's easier to do an appliance in that case instead of a physical card or multiple physical cards. So I will tell you the thing about this answer that drives me nuts. Those physical appliances are little computers running Linux and maybe running Asterisk. So we have the exact same problem. It's just, I guess it's just managed by somebody else instead of the end user now. <laughs> Uh, Pretty much. I would still, I would still like to see drivers go up into the upstream kernel, but <laughs> I guess it's not yeah, always practical. I, to speak to that briefly, um, I mean, first off, I agree from an open source perspective. Drivers upstream is always a good thing. But um, one of the benefits that I have seen personally by splitting it out is um, um, lightning and damage issues. We used to regularly mm -hmm. lose. Um, FXO, FXS ports be from close lightning strikes and sometimes the hardware they were plugged in, whereas a relatively self-contained, less expensive gateway, I can sit out there, isolate it, and if it gets fried, throw another one in. This is true. All right. So we, we've talked about kind of asterisk as a business phone system, but 
sounds like that's not necessarily the uh, um, the real focus anymore. When we talk about Asterisk as a toolkit, what what things have we added besides just you know routing phone calls to to, to really kind of make it a toolkit? What's what are the new toys? Uh, the new toys. ARI, ARI, ARI. Um, <laughs> ARI stands for Asterisk REST Interface, um, which is essentially cool. a simplified, I don't need to know that much about telephony um, <laughs> to write telephony applications. Uh-huh. Um, a goal is to make it as simple and self-contained so that people don't have to worry about the internal workings of Asterisk or C code and stuff, mm-hmm. um, but still give the primitives to... Um, build cool things. So an example is, um, I'll go back a bit. Um, So it uses HTTP requests and a WebSocket. WebSocket gives you JSON-based events, events like um, someone pressed a key, so a DTMF key, Mm -hmm. um, a call went into your application, uh, and then you have easy REST interface to control that call. So you you might say slash answer to answer the call or slash playback to start playing back an audio file. Hmm. Or you might have a bridge to connect multiple things together. Um, One of the cool things about the bridges in ARI is if you put in more than two, it just becomes a conference bridge. (laughs) If you take the third one out, it goes back and optimizes itself all behind the scenes to be more efficient. Nice. Um, And so it gives, it, it takes or it gives outside developers an easier way to extend asterisk without knowing C. Got it. Um, one of the reasons we did this was actually kind of selfish. It was for Switchbox, one of our commercial products. Mm-hmm. Um, they wanted better call queuing, and writing a call queue in C is not the best um, because call queuing at its core can be considered a lot of business logic. Mm-hmm. And so we made ARI to give them the primitives to write a call queue in JavaScript, which they did. Um, and that allowed them, not as asterisk developers, <laughs> as basic telephony understanding people to write a call center queuing application. Um, and they were able to easily add in skills-based routing and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's where stuff has gone towards. There's also other cool things that, that means, like you could do multiple asterisk, asterisk instances and have a ARI application that spans across all of them mm-hmm. so you can connect things together. It's just lots of cool stuff. Making it, moving that stuff out into JavaScript instead of C keeps asterisk out of the news for getting uh, getting owned by, you know, insert hacker from foreign country here because you're your business logic people that aren't great C programmers had to go in and write terrible C, whereas doing it in JavaScript sort of keeps you safe. <laughs> yeah, it's it, JavaScript is just one language. You could do it in Python if you wanted. Go, mm. Rust. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's, so I suppose the fact that it's the the fact that it's just REST and WebSockets, anything that supports HTTP calls and WebSockets, you can write it in. So you could do it in C if you really wanted to. If if you yeah really yep. really wanted to. <laughs> Yep. The other nice thing is because you're using you're using outside languages, you can leverage outside SDKs for doing things. Mm-hmm. Um, like the latest thing that we kind of foresaw or expected would happen, the whole AI boom. Mm-hmm. Um, like three or four years ago, we added the ability to send media in ARI out to the ARI application, where you can then use an SDK like google or something else and just pipe the audio in and go from there so you text to speech it and then take that result and ship it off to chat gpt if you want all without having to touch asterisk or the c code it's cool and i hate it at the same time <laughs> yep. so speaking of ari um i've got a bit of a throwback question um again because it's been a while since i've been digging around at source level um <clears throat> but back when I was extremely active in Asterix, uh, we had a module called External IVR, and it was specifically designed because you could, if you had long IVRs where people were keying ahead, they already knew what questions they were coming were coming, and they were just punching in answers. You could lose touch tones in there. Um, 
does AR does ARI solve that issue as well? Uh, yeah. It shouldn't okay. skip DTMFs or anything. What you do with those is up to the ARI application, but there is a guarantee that it is serialized. You will get okay. them all. So they do come in order. Awesome. Um, and then a uh, second question, completely unrelated to that, but um, <laughs> we've been talking, everything we've been talking about to this point is voice and DTMF. Um, does Asterix talk SMS, MMS, any other um, traditional phone type communications? So this is, a, this is an answer. Um, SMS and MMS from a implementation and standards perspective is complicated and messy at times. <laughs> Imagine at that. Best. <laughs> at times? Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Some implementations are better than others. Um, so there is, there is technically the ability to send and receive text messages over SIP, which some providers do use for SMS. Um, generally, these days, it's delivered over webhooks and using a REST um, interface instead. So those don't have direct ability within Asterisk to do that. Um, from a company perspective, um, that's what we do. And then we use SIP as a notification mechanism um, to say, hey, something came in so that we don't have to maintain a persistent like WebSocket or anything. We just send it over SIP. Makes sense. Ding, check your messages. Basically, um, the way it works is, yeah, it comes in, it goes into the dial plan, and then in the case of free PBX, it executes uh, an AGI that goes and queries the REST interface. Uh, back when I was actively trying to sell asterisk-based phone systems, one of the fun things that I would tell customers is I would I would I would I would really play up the idea there. It's based on asterisk. It's it's super configurable. We can do it. We can do anything you want to. We can make it call you up and sing happy birthday to you on your birthday if you really wanted to. And that's always been one of the things that. I mean, still to this day, I think it's cool about the Astra system is basically anything that you can dream up, you can make the thing do because it gives you the ability. I mean, back in those days, I was just building stuff right in the dial plans, but you could, you could make all of that stuff work. Yep. And I, I kind of assume that as, as you go forward and you push into kind of these new arenas, um, that's beyond just voice, beyond just phone calls. That's still sort of one of the guiding principles, isn't it? That you want to you want to make this as modular and configurable, so that whatever crazy thing a business or an individual has, they can they can make it happen with Asterisk. Yep. Um, and the other thing is, we're not afraid to just be a component in a larger system. Mm -hmm. um, we can't be everything, do everything to everyone, and do it well. Um, it just doesn't end well. I value the stability we have <laughs> yeah, and not having um, critical issues occur at night. Um, so that that's something, there's a balance there, but we try our best. Yeah. Uh, so it, we, talk about, we talk about voice. I'm assuming Asterisk can play with video as well, can't it? Yes, yes, yes. What, what, does that, it can. what does that look like? I mean, it's video. It looks like pictures. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of pictures at once. Yeah. So are we doing? Um, are we? Are we doing? Do we do video over SIP? Uh, is this RTSP? Like what? What? How? Do, how does this work? Uh, so the WebRTC. I remember when side tangent. Um, I remember when I was at a WebRTC conference. One of the first ones. People were like. WebRTC will replace everything in two years, including our, <laughs> including our cell phones and desk phones. Oh. Here we are. Yeah. Um, context for people who may not know, WebRTC is a set of um, standards uh, for the web browser to allow um, web pages to do real-time communication. Mm -hmm. um, it uses underneath the hood some existing voice over IP standards. They just kind of mudged them together and then made them more complicated at times um, and then made interesting choices such as, yeah, there's no, they didn't define a way that you actually exchange the information that's left up to you. <laughs> it gets messy real fast. Yes. So our implementation was based on that, allowing 
multi-party um, conference bridges to occur in, using WebRTC clients. Um, and within Asterisk, that required adding support for having multiple video streams because we didn't we didn't have stream support before. Mm -hmm. um, we just assumed one audio, one video. When you're in a multi-party, that's not true anymore. Mm. Um, and then from a SIP perspective, it was adding all the uh, WebRTC stuff. Um, so it essentially allows you locally to hold a multi-party video conference in your browser. Yeah. One of the one of the real fun things about WebRTC is you can use whatever codec you want to so long as it's H uh X X264 baseline. That's that's the one. There was a there was a long argument about whether H264 was supposed to be mandatory or not at WebRTC. For a period of time it was not going to be. Uh I know there is a uh there's a development effort over at Google right now to add x265 support to uh, webrtc yep. and i am i'm sort of looking forward to that and i'm hoping <laughs> i'm hoping against all hope that they uh, they do it in a way that's not quite as brain dead as the x264 support so and i'm sure i'm sure you know this being one that's played with it um in chrome and in firefox there is an entirely separate code path for handling WebRTC as opposed to all of the other video handling. Yep. And I know this because one of the other projects I'm involved in, we tried to take feeds from security cameras and use it with WebRTC and throw it to the browser for, you know, basically real-time viewing. And unless your security camera has a specific X264 baseline option, the browser's just like, no, we're not going to play with that. <laughs> Yep. This is also slightly extending in over to um, uh, Twitch and stuff um, with uh, mm -hmm. WIP, if I recall correctly. Yes. Um, they require very specific H.264 attributes to work properly. Um, if you don't, then nope. It just doesn't play. Yeah, I think it's a uh, profile ID has to be. I think they're. I think they're literally doing a string compare. Probably. Uh, <laughs> in in that project, one of the hacks that we added that makes it work is you can just override the profile ID with the one that works on your on your camera feed, and sometimes that yep. makes it work. <laughs> yeah, codec negotiation. It's an art. Yeah, it's always it's always been a pain though, um, and I assume you guys have you guys have fought with this too, trying to make various things work in asterisk. Oh yeah, and along with varying interpretations of standards and specs. Oh yes, yeah. that is that is always the uh, that is always the fun part. Um, is there anything else that's new? Um, uh, we we talked a little bit about kind of this idea of call centers. Like, what had to change in Asterisk to be able to go from you know a a hundred phones in a small business to a full-blown call center or maybe multiple call centers tied together like what i'm sure there were some challenges there um yeah so all that ari work and then profiling around that mm -hmm. um, we essentially put in a message bus an asynchronous message bus inside of asterisk um previously a lot of stuff would just synchronously do things in critical paths um like <laughs> like it's sending voice and it's also writing it to a text file in the same thread, <laughs> which is generally not great because you want voice to generally go every 20 milliseconds. What and could possibly go wrong? <laughs> disk IO is a little <laughs> out there. Um, so there's a lot of optimizations around that. Mm. Um, and then just more flushing out of ARI to ensure that it has all the functions it needs because like in a call center, you need to monitor the state of phones to know if mm -hmm. they're available, they're on the phone, they're not on the phone, um, all that kind of stuff. But it's worked well. Um, and uh, community doesn't currently use ARI, but I'm pushing them to. But um, yeah, they are a, so they're going off a tenant now. They're a multi-tenant, multi-asterisk Kubernetes-based mm. VoIP platform. So it scales up and down. Mm -hmm. Um, so they were leveraging their knowledge and the issues they ran into to 
in the future more refine and improve asterisk in that regard too. Yeah. Um, it's different uh, different problems for different areas. Yeah, D- different problems at different scales too. Yeah. Like the 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 issues that we would run into doing a a business phone system are just completely different from trying to do th- that sort of a, a a deployment. Let's talk about security for a minute. And when when David was asking about uh Sengoma as kind of the new corporate overlord, one of the things that I couldn't help but think about is no matter how bad a company is at managing open source, it's better than having a young developer named Giatan come along and you know help out until you finally make him a co-maintainer and then he pushes a uh, <laughs> he pushes a malicious backdoor on one of your releases. Like no matter how bad Sengoma messes it up, it's not going to be that bad. <laughs> I mean, you'd hope. <laughs> Never say never. Uh, well, I mean, I suppose, but I, I honestly, I can't. I can't imagine that. I can't imagine a serious company making a a, a goof that doing something that malicious um, or a mistake that would have quite the same repercussions. Uh, and for those that don't know, it, it's the the open source library XZ, um, a a developer Gia Tan, who is almost certainly not a real person. It's probably a three-letter agency from some country, um, came along and volunteered to be a co-maintainer and finally got the co-maintainer position and then added a backdoor in XZ that adds a backdoor to SSH. And uh, thankfully, a Microsoft engineer, this is hilarious, a Microsoft engineer caught it because SSH logins were taking an extra 500 milliseconds. And... It's hilarious. It's like he must not have been on the Teams developer group if 500 milliseconds was enough to stand out to him. Like the, all of all of the jokes at Microsoft's expense are hilarious to me around this. But at the same time, the dude is an absolute hero for finding it. Um, but in, anyway, so this this was this thought that came to mind. Sangoma's Sangoma's better than that. Like even if there are problems, it's better to have a corporation come and take over rather than asterisk fall down that sort of rabbit hole. Yeah, so I'll, I'll talk somewhat about how it works. Um, so there's only technically three people who have direct commit access. I think I'm one of them, mm-hmm. but I've never used it, I don't <laughs> think. Um, and then I think George has it, and then I think that might actually be it. Um, just because one of my philosophies is we should never commit directly. Everything go through code review. Mm-hmm. Um, we're not immune from that. Sure. Um, the same stipulations. Um, and we don't, there's no, we don't do code, ma- co- we don't do co-maintainers or anything uh, of a project as a whole from outside the company. Okay. Um, that I have trust if, I can, I have the ability to see who you are and stuff inside the company. Mm-hmm. Um, I trust that more. Um, so otherwise, there is an elevated role, uh, which allows people to triage issues and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but otherwise, everyone's treated equal. You know, that, that idea that you're, you're only maintain, maintainers are only allowed to be from within the company. Uh, a month ago, I've made have found that a bit onerous. But suddenly, that seems like a really good idea. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's just it's the way it's always been, and I, I personally don't see a reason to change it. I also would not wish the responsibility of maintainership on anyone else. <laughs> yeah, I, I get that. Um, I assume there have been security security vulnerabilities over the years. Um, are there <laughs> are there any that really stick out as having been particularly uh, noteworthy? Um, none that immediately come to mind. Um, I think there were maybe a handful of cases where a packet could crash asterisk. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think one of those was in a really obscure protocol for Cisco specific phones called SCCP, which hilariously is not technically a Cisco protocol because it actually came from a company that Cisco acquired, Uh uh, which is amusing. Um, 
But yeah, we're completely open with our security vulnerability stuff. We mm -hmm. publish security vulnerability reports. Um, and this is something from uh, going back to Sangoma and open source, this is something I'm also working on from a company perspective too. Um, standardizing our process, bug bounty program, all of that across the entire company, products, services, infrastructure, everything, mm -hmm. um, just to make it more open. Yeah. And just to be clear, I was not I was not taking a swing there at Sangoma and how their open source works. I was just I was just making making the point about how it is infinitely better than having having the problem that the XC project did. Um, you can take swings if you want. It's fine. Well, I I am not afraid to do so if I think the the situation warrants it. But I have not seen anything at this point that warrants it. Um, I do know, kind of pulling on the security thread for a moment longer. Um, I do know that one of the problems people used to have is where they would they would accept SIP calls from the outside, and they would have, you know, essentially a weak password protecting that. It would get found, and then suddenly you have a essentially an open, or sometimes literally an open SIP relay, and uh, on the internet, open relays on the internet is a bad thing, and. Uh, you know, I, I, I imagine spam calls would get routed through that, but you also had calls going out to, um, uh, to, to toll numbers where you would get, suddenly find several hundred dollars of, of toll calls on your bill. Uh, is that still a thing that happens? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Still a thing. Yeah. Still a thing. Um, internally, I hang out in the trunking channels. Um, which are SIP trunking channels. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's it's still a thing, still showing up. Um, people are either... Um, the more more common thing these days is finding phone provisioning files mm. um, that are open over TFTP or yeah. some other mechanism yeah, and then grabbing the username and password from that. Um, and also weak usernames and passwords on web interfaces. Mm -hmm. um, is also a common thing. Um, like um, trying to brute force these days, stuff is generally locked down enough with like fail to ban and other stuff that mm -hmm. stuff gets caught fairly quickly that way. It's, it's the other mechanisms. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. So is it generally these uh, either unrestricted or where, where a via TFTP, one of these files has gotten leaked. Is that why we get calls about our vehicle's extended warranty? Is that how we get those calls? <laughs> oh, no. I could go on a rant about this. <laughs> well, who wants see, to talk? We support rants. We support who wants, rants. Who wants to talk stir shaken? Oh, yes. Oh, Let's yes. Let's talk stir shaken. So give us the background first. I, I sort of no, know what you're talking give about. Background. I don't want to give background first. I want to ask you. What do you think Stir Shaken is, and what is it for? Um, I isn't that a a law that got passed that basically said you're not allowed to descend spam phone calls? Am I thinking about the right mm. thing? Um, not exactly. Okay, David, are you going to take a stab, or do you just know? Um. As I commented in uh, Discord, I'm quickly Googling. Oh. <laughs> so that's cheating. It is cheating. Um, <laughs> so I, I will say what Stir Shaken is. Stir Shaken is a mechanism to assert your authority to use a phone number for your caller ID. Um, or basically a level of trust. So there's three different levels, A, B, and C. A means, yeah, this person is totally in their right to use this phone number. B is, I know them as a customer, but I don't know that phone number, so maybe. And then C is, nope, I don't know that much. You may have noticed I did not say anything about spam calls. <laughs> and that's because it doesn't really stop spam calls. <laughs> It just stops using random caller IDs. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't, it helps to a degree. The problem is that spammers are just getting phone numbers that give them a stir shaken rating of A or B. 
And so it's still making through. Mm -hmm. The whole stopping spam calls thing is a separate thing about the reputation of phone numbers, where stir shaken plays a factor, but other information about the phone numbers is needed to make that judgment, essentially. So we've gone through all of this work, which is continuing to change and isn't really deployed across the world or enough. And here we are. It is very reminiscent of some of the schemes in email to stop spam emails like SPF. Actually, Stir Sagan sounds very much like SPF to me. Uh, this... I'll also say this. On a Stir Shaken call, you receive an HTTPS address that you then have to retrieve. Oh, what could possibly go wrong with that? Uh, to get the certificate used for that call because it is certificate all it is all certificate based so yeah so are we just stuck with spam phone calls then for the foreseeable future <laughs> uh i i know i know they've thrown a couple of people in jail for making millions of spam phone calls and uh that seems to maybe have helped a little bit but I don't know. It'd be nice to be able to find an actual technical solution to it. Yeah. So one of the things about Stir Shaken is it does in, embed an identifier that you can submit to um, the authorities and they can trace it back and then go after the originator, mm. um, which can help. Yeah. David? I was just going to ask, um, I've noticed on my uh, personal cell phone over the last six six months a year or so it started um telling me likely spam call um is that stir shaken in practice or is that just something that cell phone companies are doing or something uh both it can be stir shaken but um some cell phone companies are paying reputation companies to provide a reputation score for phone numbers mm -hmm. um so they look at like how they i, I I believe they have honeypots and stuff that identify the frequency of the call use, where it's going, and that kind of information. Mm -hmm. And then you can derive kind of an intent behind that. However, spammers are now catching on and rotating through phone numbers faster so that they don't reach whatever magical threshold to be considered potentially spammy. Yes, it is, uh, it is disheartening how many parallels there are between phone call spam and email spam seems like the exact same sort of a cat and mouse game yep mm, fun so something else that we still have to deal with are faxes faxes are still a thing aren't they faxes are still a thing asterisk has to handle faxes and uh sip does not like faxes does it <laughs> um how do i answer that Fa SIP does handle faxes. <laughs> However, the various implementations of doing so may or may not handle faxes. <laughs> Are we sensing a theme here when it comes to SIP? <laughs> it's all about the implementation. I mean, that's just a theme with technology in general, but yes. Yeah. So, um, disclaimer, Sangoma has a faxing product. Um, it works generally good. <laughs> still sold. Um, it's it's still it pains me every time. It's still a big thing. Fax is still big. I think it'll be big until the heat death of the universe. Yeah. All right. So here, here's the question: Of all of the faxes that get sent, what percentage of them do you think actually has a real fax machine on one end, as opposed to? a digital service making a fax to another digital service. <laughs> Actually a lot. Oh, you think so? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Doctors offices, medical practices, they they use tons of fax like physical fax machines. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Uh, it's true. So what's the what's the problem? Why are why are faxes hard when you digitize and then packetize them? Why why doesn't it just work? People's voices oh. just work. Why don't faxes just work? Uh, two reasons. One, if you're doing purely as audio, then um, they're not as tolerant to jitter and packet loss as we are as humans. 
And so that throws them completely off. Mm -hmm. From a, uh, from a, so there is a spec called T38, mm -hmm. loose spec. <laughs> as, as such things are. <laughs> implementations reflect that, um, which actually turns it into underlying, um, they call them UDPTL packets to transport the raw fax information. That generally works fine. Um, I would say 99%. Um, so it's it works as good as fax can. Yeah. Um, the... I will throw in an additional fun fact, though. There is also a specification for doing modem over IP <laughs> in SIP. <laughs> oh, fun. We don't support that. My, second, my question, though, why do you think it exists? Because no, I can tell you, I can tell you probably why it exists. It's because you've got remote hardware like network switches sitting in network rooms around the world. Uh, one of the places I get to work on these is in hotels. So you'll have an MDF in a hotel, and there's a network switch or some kind of a phone system, even, and it's got a serial port on it, and it's got an old V whatever robotics modem sitting there connected off to a phone line and there's a really good chance that that phone line goes over sip and they want to be able to remote dial into it and use the modem to be able to get back into their phone system or network switch or whatever when something happens to the ip address and they can't get into it that way that is one of the reasons the second might surprise you okay um it came about during an age where credit card machines were not ip ah uh, that would be the other one that makes sense yeah. too and they were like, well, modem over, modem over IP, anyone? <laughs> Doesn't mean it's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. Does it ever just, do you ever just sit and stop and think, like take fax machines, for instance, like the, the level of abstraction we have to make this work. So you start out with an analog piece of paper, you put it in a fax machine and it digitizes it. A modern, modern fax machine will digitize it and then converts it from that digital signal back to the analog fax signal. And then when it hits the next device, it gets converted from that analog fax signal back into digital via T38. It goes out over all of the different, again, layers of abstraction to go from endpoint A to endpoint B, goes back to analog, back to digital in a fax machine, and then back to analog at a printout. Uh, it's just it's mind boggling sometimes. And this is not the only place in technology where this happens, but I think faxes are one of the great examples of it. And just the, I don't know, is, is it, is it ludicrous? Is it crazy? <laughs> I mean, I think it's amazing. It works. <laughs> also true. Also true. <laughs> no, that, that stuff doesn't phase me. It's because fax, fax while still being used is not as common as just calls. What perplexes me and I just, have to like just stop sometime and just shake my head is SIP as a standard has been interpreted in different ways. Mm. So I'm amazed sometimes that stuff <laughs> can just talk to each other. And I will give an example without naming a provider. Mm -hmm. There is a provider with about four different implementations of SIP, some of which can't even talk to each other. And I'm just like, it shouldn't be that way. How do how how does this even? I don't know. How did we how did we get to this place? Um, okay, so somebody wants to get started with asterisk, and I I will I will say um, the the barrier for entry for asterisk is actually really low. You can run it. I'm sure on a Raspberry Pi. You can run it on a virtual machine on your desktop. Um, but what what are some pointers that you would give someone that finds this fascinating and wants to start playing with it? Uh, so www.asterisk.org. Um, there's some info there. Our main documentation site these days is um, docs.asterisk.org. Mm -hmm. um, and a project that we did a few years ago um, was called Super Awesome Company, uh, which is like a pre-created, pre-formulated um, set of configuration files for an office mm -hmm. with fictional people, common functionality, um, that kind of stuff. So if you're leaning towards more of a 
phone system perspective to get your feet wet, mm -hmm. um, that's a great opportunity. Um, you can use a physical SIP phone or a actual client on your desktop mm -hmm. um, or WebRTC, but do not do WebRTC because <laughs> we should talk about WebRTC. <laughs> uh, and then from like a developer perspective, there's some tutorials on the doc site as well showing ARI um, in some different ways, like interacting with calls, connecting mm -hmm. them together, that kind of stuff. Um, it's basically pick what you're interested in and go from there. Yeah, super interesting. Um, I'm I'm curious. Uh, well, I'll let David get a question in first, and then I want to ask about the direction that Asterisk is going in the future. Um, so this might be a decent precursor to that question. Um, what are, if any, the uh, big or small Asterisk competitors out there, and how do you compare? Um, so there's free switch, um, and technically Yate still, mm -hmm. um, Camellio, you, mm, I mean, Camellio is iffy iffy, um, to be quite honest, I don't focus on any of them. Um, I just listen to the community and stuff. So mm -hmm. that's one of the times I say, I don't know these days. Um, I know some people who have moved from free switch over to asterisk and said, we are actually ahead in the areas they care about, um, which is nice to hear. Yeah. Um, Yate, who remembers Yate? Do either of you? Uh, the name sounds familiar, but nothing more than that. Yeah. So it was a, it was another um, communications toolkit kind of thing that kind of went in the direction of, um, uh, BTS, um, What's, it's radio, a, it stands radio for what? And, it stands for what? Yet another telephone exchange? Yet another telephone engine, I think. Um, but they went in the direction of doing, um, software defined radio for, um, mobile. Hmm. Um, and then Chameleon open SIPs are not really communication toolkits or phone systems. Um, they're SIP proxies. So they hmm. are more vastly more efficient at moving SIP traffic around and that kind of thing. Uh, so do you still see implementations where you put um, Camellia or open SIPs in front of Asterix? Oh, yeah. To handle that, that SIP proxying, and then Asterix actually handles the all the rest of it. Yeah, so from that perspective, a lot of people tend to treat Asterix as a component for doing media-based stuff, um, the application side, and then they offload... Um, more of the general SIP stuff to Camellio, um, since it's just more efficient at doing that mm -hmm. um, at a higher scale. Yeah. It also allows you to load balance and stuff. So that is actually a really great great segue into what's what's coming next for Asterisk. What are the things you guys are, are looking at and working on? What, what new features can you hype us up about? <laughs> can I hype you up about? Yeah, come on, hype us up. Let's get some energy hype in here. <laughs> I'm not a hype guy. I just do stuff and things. <laughs> <laughs> or tell people to do stuff and things. Yeah. Um, I'm really trying to leverage the knowledge and information we have from, um, did I call it? Did I tell you guys it was community? That's the whole tricks box thing. Um, think, yeah, their platform, the platform is called community, which is a headache for me because you have community and then you have the asterisk community. <laughs> <laughs> and so now I'm like, I'm doomed on naming. Yes. Um, so they're scalable up and down thing. I'm trying to learn as much as I can about that um, to more flush out asterisk in that area to make it scale more, to add missing functionality. One of those would be um, a tenant identifier, um, which is a real simple thing to just tie channels and calls to a tenant. So you can have more information in events about what tenant a call relates to. Mm -hmm. Um, we don't really have that kind of thing currently, but they leverage it heavily. Um, I also want to more flush out our external media, which is the ability to send and receive media to ARI stuff. Um, right now, that's very VoIP-ish and not very web-ish. <laughs> um, it's RTP packets, UDP RTP packets back and forth. I want to shove that over a WebSocket. Um, and just make it easier to send media back and forth. Um, and then uh, 
Everyone ready to take another drink? AI, AI, AI. <laughs> However, my goal isn't to shove AI into Asterisk. It's just to give the tools to make it easier to integrate outside of Asterisk. Um, so, like, we did a demo at Astrocon, which um, should be on YouTube, um, and was very uh, annoying at the time. Um, we were doing live transcription uh, mm -hmm. as me and my colleague Mike were presenting. Mm -hmm. And so we were just talking. It was just live transcoding or live translating, live whatever, <laughs> over on the other screen as we're talking. And so I glanced over and saw myself speaking in tech <laughs> and then promptly went, I you, can't look at this. Your, your brain just shuts down. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, it does. Um, so more easily facilitating that kind of stuff because I... It's no. It should be no secret. It, AI is something we're looking at too. Sure, um, that is actually a a good question to ask. What is what is Astrocon and when is it next? Uh, Astrocon. Ooh, marketing spiel. <laughs> um, Astrocon is the Asterisk Users Conference. Generally happens once a year where we get together, um, have presentations about various things, um, talk about stuff. Uh, we usually have a developer conference beforehand where we bring up our qualms, quibbles, and talk about improvements and stuff. Um, I can't say when or where it is because I don't know yet. Ah. All right. Uh, it's been Fort Lauderdale the past few years. Maybe it'll be there again. Maybe it won't. Stay tuned. Um, I should also add our videos, our presentations were recorded. Um, and once this is done, I'll pop it into Discord the link to that playlist. Um, oh, so awesome. even if you didn't go and you're curious, um, you can peruse. I did a two or three talks. I've already forgotten. I did a talk on external media for transcription purposes, and I did a asterisk um, over the past year, like what we did, um, some of the hints of what's coming up, that kind of stuff. Yeah, People can take a gander there if they wish. All right. We are getting close to the end. David, do you have any final questions that maybe one final question you want to get in? Absolutely. I've got one final question that kind of goes back to Sangoma as a whole, um, especially with all the mergers and acquisitions. Um, is Asterix uh, Sangoma's core? And as they're bringing in things, because I'll pick on one thing that I know about personally. Um, you've got Switchbox Cloud and Star to Star. And there's kind of a broad overlap of functionality there, um, which Switchbox Cloud being Switchbox, I assume, is Asterisk based. Um, Star to Star being an acquisition, I assume, is not, but I don't actually know. Um, are you migrating everything that you're merging and acquiring to an Asterisk core if it's not already? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in and make a quick guess, and I can be entirely wrong, and that's fine. The name Star to Star makes me think that it is something to do with one asterisk talking to another, because the asterisk is a star. Good. Um, star to Star <laughs> is an interesting case. I, I, I think they were asterisk, and then they were something... I don't know what they're currently on. I've lost track, to be quite honest. Um, but going forward... Um, I would expect our acquisitions to be, well, I hope, this is a push at least, um, to be <laughs> asterisk in some way. So um, community is a purely asterisk. Um, they are currently on a forked version of asterisk, but I try to reduce that delta, as I've said before. Mm -hmm. um, Switchbox, also on asterisk, as you know. Um, they are quite literally don't have a fork of asterisk. They're not special. They are on certified asterisk. Um, from a existing product perspective, uh, if it makes sense and there's some benefit, then it is always evaluated. And then going forward for like new products um, that may, or new products and new services, our favor is always asterisk mm -hmm. if it makes sense. Yeah. All right. So maybe the hardest question we've had, because you've got to do some set math in your head, you have to think about all the things you wanted to talk about and then compare that to what we have talked about. And so the question is, is there anything we did not ask you that you wanted to make sure and cover? Uh, I wanted to rant about WebRTC. I think we got a, a, a at least a small rant about WebRTC in. 
I ranted a little bit about, about WebRTC. Goodness. I was not a rant about WebRTC. <laughs> oh. I don't know. Do we have enough time for a rant? We have we have enough time for a very short rant, if you want to uh, give us a couple of minutes worth. Okay. I, I don't know if it'll be a rant, but a caution. Okay. For anyone who watches slash listens slash is watching this right now, um, if you ever decide to delve into WebRTC, know this. It is relatively easy to do the demo stuff of making a call between two things. That is vastly different than creating something that goes into production because there are very many layers to WebRTC and many standards and specs. And it is not a question of if it will fail, it is a question of when it will fail. Hotel Wi-Fi being a very good example and then you need to know those specs in order to figure out what happened. Additionally, SIP and WebRTC embed IP addresses in the signaling, meaning if you opt for the cloud, such as AWS, which is a NATed environment, and you're actually your asterisk or other WebRTC platform is on a local IP address, you need to ensure that you configure things such that your public IP address goes in the signaling, or else you will have no audio. I'm, I'm, my PTSD flashbacks from working on this are, are coming. Uh, one more thing with that is the browsers, Google, will make some security change and not tell you about it, and it'll break all the things for a while. Uh, what, MDNS? For a while, our stuff was broken because yep. of MDNS. Yeah. That was fun. Oh, goodness. Okay, so final questions. Uh, I want to ask quickly, what's the weirdest and most surprising thing you've seen somebody do with Asterisk? Where's, where's the place that you've discovered it that surprised you the most? That I can talk about? Well, yes, that you can talk about. Uh, I can't give <laughs> names, but at least one, one tax agency in the world uses it, um, which... I had mixed feelings about. Yeah, yeah. I was just thinking that. <laughs> but uh, that was nice. Yeah, fun, fun. Um, okay, so final two questions, and these I have to ask. I'm I'm basically contractually obligated to ask, or people will, will send me mail about it. Uh, what is you personally, your favorite text editor and scripting language? <laughs> text editor. Uh, Sublime Text 3. Okay. I have a paid for license. Cool. Um, scripting language. Define scripting language. Not C, not a systems language, but something that you would you would hack together a little a little script to do something. And whatever I mean, I I won't tell you that it's a wrong answer. So whatever one you want to you want to pick. Uh, I mean Bash. However, I also do quick stuff and go. Okay. I think either of those are, are totally legitimate answers. I For a second there, I expected you to say something like, well, the asterisk dial plan language, of course. <laughs> no, that would be Lorne, um, yeah. who I am trying to convince to, for you to, yeah, we'll see. Yeah, yeah we're, we're open to it. Fun. All right. Well, we appreciate the time, sir. Thank you so much for being here. It was a lot of fun to learn about Asterisk, what Asterisk is up to these days, and uh, get the uh, get the story straight from you guys about the Sangoma acquisition. And uh, I've got to say, I feel pretty good about it, all things considered. I, uh, I'm I'm happy with the new corporate overlords, as it were. So. Yes, much to the dismay of many, I'm sure. The world did not end. <laughs> Nothing changed. <laughs> Imagine that. All right, thank you so much for being here. It's been great. Thanks for having me again. Yes, sir. All right, David, what do you think? What are you, What's I your takeaway? It. Um, it's, it's awesome to catch up on Asterix. Yeah. Um, it's, it's cool to just get the few questions I had answered. Um, directly, um, I mean, as I said at the beginning, um, bit of uh, Astri's fanboy, and mm -hmm. just in, in enjoyed it. Yeah, I'm I'm real intrigued by the ARI, the Asterisk Rest inter Rest Interface. I assume that's what that stands for. Um, Absolutely. It sounds like you could do some really fun things with that. Um, so I, I I do some smart home stuff, and I. Right now, a lot of it actually works using uh, Python 
uh, Flask and a little REST interface I built inside Python Flask. And I'm, I'm now thinking, well, I could pull one of the desk phones back out and connect it to Asterisk and then write a little JavaScript script that would make those two things talk to each other. So then you could like dial in to your smart home. <laughs> It's like the sky's the limit with this stuff, and that's one of the fun things about it is if you can if you can dream it up, you can make it happen. And uh, that, that that was always the uh, that was always the serotonin hit from working with Asterisk. Like somebody would go, we really and this happened to me. We we have had problems with phone calls. We need to record all of our incoming phone calls. It's like, oh, I'm sure I can do that with Asterisk. Spend a few minutes on Google. Yeah, here's here's essentially how you do this, and you go and you set up a little system to record all incoming phone calls, and then of course you. You add the note at the beginning. Thank you for calling such and such. Just a note, your phone calls may be recorded for quality assurance purposes. But then, you know, you're off to the races. And one of these days, I'm sure they will call me back with the problem that they are out of disk space. But <laughs> it's not happened yet. <laughs> it's just it's just fun. It's fun that you can do all this stuff with it. David, do you have anything that you want to plug um, not specifically, but it never hurts to plug Twit and uh, the Untitled Linux Show, yeah. which I also get the opportunity to co-host on from time to time. Uh, so I would say go check that out. I think the plan is for you to be one of the co-hosts this Saturday. Um, that's what I was told. All right. <laughs> Uh, so next week, uh, we have, uh, I believe Catherine is down to co-host, and we're going to talk to Gina. Oh my goodness, this is a German name. Hodge? Hobg? I have no idea how to pronounce that. She will tell us how to pronounce it when we have her on. Um, but she is the developer behind Octoprint. And that is the little Linux distro that you can put on a Raspberry Pi to control a 3D printer. And I've had one of those running for a long time. And Gina is probably going to chew me out because it's a really old version of it. But hey, it still works. Um, and so that is next week, April 10th. So make sure and come back uh, for that one. Uh, let's see, things that I have to plug. Well, of course, there's the Untitled Linux show over on Twit. We mentioned that uh, at Hackaday. We sure appreciate Hackaday. It's the new home of Floss Weekly. And uh, don't forget to check the site out. And my security column goes live on Fridays. Uh, have a lot of fun with that. And I think that's it. That's that's pretty much what we want to let you know about. Thank you to everyone in the chat room that caught us live. Thank you to everyone on the download that listens. We sure appreciate it. Be sure to tell a friend about the show if you enjoyed it. And uh, hey, we will see you next time on Floss Weekly. <laughs>